Welcome to the Everything Everywhere Travel Writer Podcast. Join award-winning freelance journalist Joan Mead Matsui. Each week, you'll hear guests from all walks of life share their travel stories, tips, and advice on a variety of travel-related topics. Thanks for spending time with us today, and now it's time to dive into our interview. David Shep has enjoyed a long career in international banking and now works as a financial and risk management consultant. It was while living in Paris in the 1980s that he first took an interest in the Church of St. Germain du Pré. He's been a frequent visitor ever since. Please welcome David Shep. David, it is such a pleasure to meet you. And I would like to start our interview today learning more about your background and how it led you to become involved with Paris's oldest church, the fundraising efforts. Okay, great, great question. Uh, there's not necessarily a, a hugely strong and obvious right. connection between the two. Um, my career was, uh, well, first as, as a, as a uh, potential academic that left academia, upper academia, years and years ago, and went into, of all um, unlikely things, I suppose, international banking. Mm-hmm. I worked for a couple of very, very major international banks, one American, one foreign, uh, over the years. And as it happens in international banking, one can, one does tend to travel around quite a lot. And I had the great good fortune of spending about half my career in Europe, uh, mainly in London and in Paris, and would travel quite a lot out of both of those former hometowns. I spent, I don't know, 10, 12 years in London and 10, 12 years in Paris. So I know both cities very, very well. Lived in Paris while doing my international banking duties, uh, and as it happened, lived Paris, as you know, is not very not very big as right. big cities go. Yes, but lived very close by the church at Saint Germain des Prés, and became attached to the church from every imaginable point of view. Uh, just walking in front of it, it's it's a breathtaking place, and walking in as one can, the current environment being accepted these days, being accepted, one can go in at any time uh, practically uh, and admire the place. Uh, I did a lot of that and got to know, just through the course of things, the, the staff, both religious and secular, involved with the church, the parish, the parishioners, uh, the people who were involved with finances and, and all of that, and admired what they were doing. And in 2012, I think it was, it was determined that the church needed a, uh, a renovation slash restoration particularly on the inside. I might come back in a bit to the inside, outside divide. It's yes. very interesting, actually. So there I was uh, talking to all kinds of people associated with the church, the, and they, the, uh, a French fundraising committee was put together to raise funds for the church. And the reason mm-hmm. that was a requirement is that although the, this church, like all churches in Paris, uh, belong to the city of Paris. It, the city of Paris is the owner. The city of Paris could only come up with about 15%, that's one five, mm-hmm. percent of the funds required or the budget needed to do the works from end to end. It was going to be a five to seven year project. These things have a tendency, as you know, Joan, to. Yes. End. Uh, and so it looks like it's going to be probably seven years, and we're five years in, five and a half years in. So um, fundraising got started in France, and about the time it reasonably well. I got involved and met all these people, and then in 2016, it became clear that I would be with my wife moving back to the United States, back into the New York City area. And so my French colleagues and friends said, well, you know, there is a committee, a fundraising committee 
in the U.S. It's a 501c3, a charitable organization recognized by the IRS and all of that, which had, well, it's hard to say, fallen on sort of clear times, not bad times. It was not going particularly strongly for a couple of reasons. And so I was asked if I would like to help out. I said, well, sure, not knowing the first thing about what that actually meant. I've never fundraised in some person like so got back to the U.S., contacted the committee, um, contacted uh, two or three of the four or five members of the committee here in the U.S. and said, hey, tell me what you'd like me to do. And the answer, of course, is raise funds. Like, well, how do you do that? <laughs> and I, yes. they said, well, that, that's the $64 question. Right. So we got going and we put some initiatives together and it started to click. I was, uh, I mean, in a modest way, but, but the trend was, was good. And I was then asked to join the board. Uh, I said, fine. It didn't change much in my day-to-day -day activities with regard to the church, but there I was a member of the board. And then about a year ago, I was asked to become the president of the board, which is fine. Um, I'm the face of the organization, I suppose, for better or for worse right now. But it all started with, um, really, my living in Paris for a long time being a neighborhood resident and really getting to know intimately well without being an expert in any of this. Uh, not a scholar, not an architect, not a preservationist per se, but uh, an inspired amateur and all those things, I suppose. And um, then when I came back to the US, I thought, yeah, let's really make this work because there are, and it's true, an awful lot of French in America, yes. a ton of Francophiles in America, uh, and everyone seems to have a sort of a different angle, a different view, and a different sensitivity to what's happening here. But the bottom line and the light motif is there are so many people who are intrigued and interested and even passionate about seeing this renovation through. The first renovation, I have to add, since uh, the 1830s, 1840s. So in a hundred, almost 200 years, uh, the church has um, not been really tended to in terms of maintaining things as they could be or should be. Uh, churches are not awash in money to begin with. And so it was thought, let's do this right. And so that's what we're trying to do under the auspices and the general direction of the building owner, which is the city of Paris and the cultural division of the city of Paris and the historic monuments part of the cultural division. This church has been classified uh, since 1860, I think, um, an official historic monument um, and therefore deserving of protection and, and renovation. So now it's just a question of putting all the, um, uh, the necessary dollars and cents and euros and, and what have you together to get to the end of the, of the project. The entire budget it's not gigantic as these things go. Probably from end to end, about $7 million. And we've raised between the French and ourselves about five, five and a bit. Uh, but things have slowed. Things have slowed for a couple of reasons. Um, mm. But we can talk about that. Yeah. So banking, living there, resident of the neighborhood, falling in love with the church by virtue of proximity and getting to know the people, moving back and making that one of my prime activities these days. Of all, excuse me, of all the historic buildings in Paris and France overall, why did this particular church touch your heart so much? That's another good question. Uh, it's not to say that others would not have right, sure. and do not. I mean, there are a ton of, of fantastic uh, architectural gems, some modern, by the way, um, uh, across the country. But it just happened that I, I was a neighbor of this church and the church touched me because I've said elsewhere, it's not a huge edifice. There are much, much bigger buildings uh, around and about both religious and secular. Mm -hmm. In fact, very few people know that the biggest church in Paris, I believe, is uh, Saint-Sulpice. And it was mm -hmm. bigger, I believe, than Notre Dame. But in any event, this church is intimate. It, it doesn't overwhelm you. It whispers. You walk in and you feel you're in the presence of an old friend. 
and it is quite moving. It's, it's, it's an extraordinarily beautiful church, both outside and inside. And other things sort of spoke to me. It is, and the tagline, if you like, it is without doubt the oldest church in Paris. I'll just touch upon in two lines the history. The church was originally founded on the current footprint in 543 AD. I remember reading that. I found that just absolutely fascinating that it goes and back. A couple of structures were, it was, it was founded as an abbey. So a church with uh, an abbatial palace and, and residences, and, and it was uh, became a place for monks and, and so on and so forth. And the reason it was called Saint-Germain-des-Prés, des Prés means out in the fields. It was out in the fields oh, in 543. Okay. Yes. It was well away from the center of town, which was on the two central islands in the Seine, which everyone knows. Yes. That's where Notre Dame is, the Ile de la Cité and the Ile Saint-Louis. This one, with their paintings, uh, interpretive paintings, way out in the fields. And of course, Paris then over the centuries grew up and, 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 and surrounded it and encompassed it. So 543, the oldest church in Paris, the church had two original structures, both of which were destroyed. In I, uh, yes. Like in one case, yep. uh, both in the eighth and ninth centuries, uh, and riots and, and other issues in the ninth century. And so it was decided uh, in the 10th century that a new church would arise. Uh, I use the word new guardedly. Right. A new church would come to life exactly on the footprint of the old. And that's the edifice we see today. It was completed in 1014 AD. And it was uh, 150 years, 125 years in the making. I don't have the exact number. But so it says 1014. That's a long time ago. It is a long time. The building has been tending its flock and been the central sort of uh, guiding element um, in that part of town uh, for over a thousand years now. The uh, the bell tower has been ringing the bells, Earl. It's been ringing, uh, ringing services for a thousand years. That's and that, and that, that got to me. Then I did some math. I thought, oh, wait a minute, how old is that? When the church was completed in 1014, uh, I like putting things in terms of apples and oranges. In 1014, the birth of George Washington was 700 years in the future. 1732, he was born. And to my mind, that seems like a long time ago. I mean, George. Yeah. Yeah, long time ago, right? Well, if you think about it, when he was born, the church was already 700 years old, and now it's more than a thousand years old, and that spoke to me. The other thing is, and again, I'm not an expert in this by any stretch, over the years, the church has uh, added on to itself a little bit, and it's become an amalgam architecturally of a multiplicity of styles. It was originally built, and you can see that quite easily today, as a Romanesque church. It's the largest Romanesque church uh, in Paris, possibly in France. I think it, uh, I think it's a bigger one down south. But in, in Paris, and so it's, its central architectural style is Romanesque. But then it incorporated over the years as these things developed, and you'll remember from the 11th century forward, Gothic architecture came to the fore in France. There are pre-Gothic and Gothic touches all throughout the church which makes it an extremely interesting and even unique uh, place. And there are, to this day, even some modern touches on the inside, which are quite interesting. So it's preserved the past. It has added uh, its present, and it speaks to the future. And that just gets me. It really does. Anyone who would like to learn more about David and the fundraising efforts, please visit Joan Matsui, travel writer, Dot com. There's also another interview I did with David uh, a few years ago, and you can find all of that at Joan Matsui Travel Writer. com. And I want to thank you again for joining me. Please join me next week for part two of my interview with David Ship. Please visit JoanMatsuiTravelWriter.com where you can subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode. While you're there, check out the travel writing courses, 
membership support platform, and private coaching services to help you learn travel writing. If you found value in this show, we would appreciate a rating on iTunes, and don't forget to tell a friend.